free. Freedom! Right here, Scott. Wow! Look at this. New table.
take one away from that uh, board title, you have to have another nonprofit title, from my understanding. So one has to help come up with a, another nonprofit. For instance, if Scott has a, a nonprofit. He Friends can, of Scott. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, I, 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 I could go under the auspices of my charitable nonprofit then. If, if you did, then this is what I'm after for Chair Hargrave when we get into our meeting, is that I'm hoping that with that, I could go on behalf of, of a backup on your uncle cap. I've been, I've been, yeah, something to just get that. Well, um, that's on the 23rd, right, or something. I think it's next week, Monday. This is our coming Monday. Or next week, Monday. The week. following Monday, yeah. Yeah, and next week, Monday, also. So, I mean, oh, if Scott goes under another hat, because, you know, I've been, I've been attending these since 2000. That's the 21st. With Willie and then the solo. Yeah, that's what I want to go to, 25th. That's what I want to go. But if I go, I, I'm in violation of the two acts. I own that money. Rich is in your share, dude. Yeah. That's the thing, Doc. You see my calendar? Yeah. You see my calendar? Yeah. Um, so I, you're really going to do a risk. I can't wait. I do have the 25th open. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to sign in that to be clear. That's an avenue with board members. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going to sign in this avenue with board members. It's, 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 Time just, just in case they try to keep me from attending the meeting. Time to go. My concern is using technology related anyway, and so it's not as if there's going to be like an over ever representation, anyways. Nor is it here anyway. Now. 
Oh yeah. So we can Listen, we can make a determination. Well, that's what I want Scott to look at because all the other neighborhood boards are having candidates tonight to bring the mayor's race in because there's, there's you know we don't have a senator's race without a governor's race. So bringing in the mayors and I know yeah. that I know that the mayor mayoral races are going um, full steam ahead. And I just wanted to bring that up. Sure. So I think it's perfect <coughs> that we know what that count is so that we can discuss that in the full board as to whether or not that should be applicable to the team now. Well, it's uh, they're going to be invited anyway. The mayor? Yeah. Okay. We have to find her as a letter is going out. Hopefully we can get somebody before the primary. Because most of them after the primary won't have a real chance. No, we won't be able to. Let, we won't have the timing this way. Next month. In order to set this thing up, we really got to have the time to set it up. And um, that's what we're pushing right now. And the primary is on the 20th. So on the 22nd, the letters go out. Um, 22nd of August? September. 20th of September is the primary. Right. So, so what month is it now? August. This is August. So, we, so let's just assume we put a letter out on 27 months and said, come 20th of September to 12 candidates of the file. Well, we have a primary. And we're not doing it to the people that file. We're not doing it to the people that are still general. We want everybody who is close. Just to let you know, uh, the majority of boards that are engaging this are doing primary. Uh, we're not doing primary. Are you, is it off the table to try to have any of the primary candidates appear before this board next month, next month being the September meeting? Uh, Which would be before name the... Of, name of who? Well, you have, in the other area, you have, uh, what, a fellow, Ray Rodriguez? Yeah. You have, like, Gary Smith. Um, you have uh, Bimbo, and what, I forget his last name. You have uh, several people who, who are seeking in the primary, you know, votes of the community. And I thought that we were going to work again speaking about this two months ago. Yeah, I mean, you know, nothing developed and nobody came up. Oh, I, I believe we had a plan then, yeah. but you wanted to do things your own. No, 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 don't even say that. Right, can I clarify, Rich? Because we, we can go to what you had. Well, let's, let's clarify. Let's get into the primary. Because Bimbo is, 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 uh, is, is, is not partisan. He is uncontested. Kurt is uncontested. Hein is uncontested. Berg is uncontested. In the primary, you have Democrats, Cavanilla, Schultz, and Rodriguez. And in the councilman's race, you have Gary Smith, Todd Poe. In the mayoral, mayoral race, that's what I was looking at, Scott, was, was from my understanding of the mayor's races that, are, that the candidates' nights that have been taking place, uh -huh. three of the nine show up. Okay. So, in my opinion, there's, it's very doable to entertain a tables full of six people. Yeah, We're only looking at six candidates. You should have to. Just no, no, for in totality. We're talking House, City Council, and Mayor, just those three races. Yeah. House, County, and City people, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There's nine. Plus, yeah, most likely Mayor, so you could be 11. Again, I felt that it was uh, important to hang out there. Well, when we get to the discussion, I mean, let's follow an, an agenda here. We'll, we'll uh, turn it up at a direction on the agenda. Okay. It's certainly not too late. I mean, we're, we're entertaining. Actually, it is too late. How long does it take to put this thing together? What do you think? I mean, I mean we put it in. The letters have to go out. People have to respond. And you have to have a, uh, an agenda set. Well, we've set the agenda, we've discussed the agenda. Um, timeliness is, is and candidates may take or lose. It's a public event, they certainly have the opportunity. Okay. And um, it's not too late to discuss doing this for September before the primary. We're not discussing it now. There's nothing to stop us from having a letter out to the primary candidates, including those for the mayor. Okay. Uh, Did you see the letter that went out? Um, I, what letter went to? When the letter went to you got a draft copy because he responded already, but it went out to all board members and that same draft was just modified and it went out to our mm -hmm. uh, commission and the uh, commission has it ready set for mailing on the 22nd. To? Yeah, to the 22nd of September? Those people selected as the primary. Excuse me. All right. So people who are in the primary are going to get a letter mailed to them on September 27th? Those people selected after the primary will be 
received a better support the October form. September 22nd. <coughs> so it's okay, it's okay for them to have less than a month's notice at that time, right? September 22nd to October. That's because right? they've already been. Uh, but how is, how is the timeliness any different in that scenario than getting a letter out now for the uh, lack, of support from, lack of support from the board to correlate that that's, letter. That's completely that's incorrect. Now I have I supported it, but I spearheaded it that it was a prerequisite of the election have, upon which you saw two months I ago. All, 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 all it's all documents. It's all on video. I have all here too. Video or not, I got it all in hard copy right here. What's hard copy to you? Hard copy of saying that you wanted to do it your way and now it's with you well, and now you're blaming the board for not No, I'm not blaming the board. Let me, let me, you just did. You let just said nobody on the board. I said in the last three weeks I did not get any information opposed to the email that I sent out in reference to. It was not a until agenda. today that I knew that, that, that it was clear that we'd have not only Keone Dudley on tonight's agenda, which we made time for. You didn't know that until today? Well, excuse me, when I got the agenda, which was last week. So at the end of last week, when I got by email the agenda, thanks to the Neighborhood Commission Office, I saw that Keone Dudley was on the schedule tonight. We made time for Keone Dudley. Yeah, two months ago when time was quote unquote time, a time, time is me, for for Dudley. The time is under uh, concerns for the city. That's it. I see. And if you review it again, you can see that. Well, I think I've seen that. Okay. So that I mean, you're talking one three minute situation but opposed see, to but Rich, hours. We discussed the opportunity to have people seeking the votes of the people before the primaries of September. We had planned two months ago. We had language two months ago. You decided differently, right? Is this because correct? Because the timing was not there in order to put everything in place. Timing means what? Well, please define timing. Because you just said one month notice, a September 22nd letter for a mid-October forum is acceptable timing to you. Yet you're saying in this scenario, a letter going out now, equal timing. What you had asked excuse for me, was excuse me, mid August letter for a mid September form. You're saying that timing is not appropriate. Find appropriate timing in this case. All right. Wrap up the letter and send it out to the people. Get okay. here. You can't move it. Done. Okay. So are okay. we okay. saying so if that's the only thing that you want is just to make sure that you get all the people for the primary. Yeah. Here. Okay. Our job is to facilitate democracy, not to side on the process board, Chair Rich. It's we discussed this months ago. It's not, well, yeah, months ago. Was, Excuse me. Was the end of June? Yeah. Is that correct. Yeah. Well. And what happened at the end of June? I told you that the stuff needed to be put out. That you meeting. told. You told. You told. We had a meeting at the at the agenda meeting. You said mm -hmm. we were there. We had a plan. Right. And then you began with you told. Correct. So I'm happy to step in and do things this way. It's important that people have a chance to see candidates in the primary. That's our goal. So thank you for the opportunity. I will make it happen. Set it up. Go ahead. How much time do we think you want to allocate to this next month? Tony? I think we should uh, Tony? Okay. One hour. One hour comes. Yeah. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I need a list of those that are being mailed to the information of those people that come. And obviously we have to follow in line with this new commission thing that we just brought out reference to. Okay. I have all that here with four minutes now. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm, I'm chair. So, okay. I'm, 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 I'm one second. Let me just make a note here. I think we're just going to end in this September primary. Okay.
Little savers.
So therefore, uh, since I got it, finally looking over. Yeah, that's Which one? Please. So if we're able to address that, and what we'll do is, uh, as a board, first of all, from this committee, uh, the Wells Committee, we'll go ahead and put it on the agenda, uh, have it based on the discussion, and uh, if the board sees fit to make comment, then we'll uh, make a comment from this board in reference to this particular situation. He can make a presentation to us. It would be a 
blessing and an act of generosity for Mr. Dan Davidson, the administrator for the State Land Use Commission, to provide and appease this board at this time because of such deadlines imposed, of such comment. I believe it's worth the effort of this board and community to offer that comment to augment its decision that East West Connect Road. So a recap of the development on 1,600 acres, approximately 12,000 homes, will be the size we're running from all of Ocean Point and all of Ebony Gentry in this one development alone. And I will, of the five items, just recap two that I believe of priority. One, Hope Peely may have on its development impact the Ottawa Street traffic signal, trigger a traffic warrant count, whereby a traffic signal, traffic light, would be operational upon this development proceeding. This is of an issue of which I believe we shouldn't be rolling the dice, but rather take up upon ourselves to provide direction to the State Land Use Commission. The second one is we have a, a bird which has been listed under the State of Hawaii for the City and County of Oahu only, the Kuei'u Owl. The Kuei'u Owl is a ground nesting endangered bird. Being a ground nesting species, this bird, from my understanding, there was no interaction with the Department of Land and Natural Resource, Wildlife and Forestry Division to take any type of analysis of how this endangered owl will be impacted upon that of which is currently of its territory for nesting. With that stated, I have made communications to personnel in the DLNR that apprised me. They had no communication from PBR, no communication from any entity regarding the Kuei'u Owl in the deliberations before the State Land Use Commission. Therefore, I will conclude that I believe it is of importance that the Chair provide and put this subject matter on the agenda as soon as possible, whereby we can engage and dissolve to give better clarity of a greater magnitude on the largest development project scope in the history of West Duwamish. Thank you. Can I, make, can I make a few comments? Uh, any other board members? I have any other comments? Um, we need to be making sure that we finish this letter. We never have. Should we make this an action item? The right hand is a surprise in the position of the work. If, 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 if what happened was is the there was an original uh, uh, comment period of, of April 8th of 2000 in discussion tonight, and as it as the meeting goes upon itself, uh, provide uh, a lot of time. Provide we can't put it on tonight's agenda. I, I think what we're resting on here is something of, of a critical matter to get three more members on this board. Provide we can then take action and have three more members, and that is a critical matter first. So I think the precedence is that we get those three members on board those three members on board, then you can have and take action, my opinion, because the three members could be taken care of in five minutes or it could take a half hour. Well, no. Right. So that's why I want to leave it to you directly. Well, um, in that respect, pending uh, time frame, uh, after we get our members on, we have a couple other issues on the table that we get to take care of. You're up next, uh, Board Member Burke. Okay, so Okay. Can you give me 30 seconds more? I apologize. Uh, Mr. John Bond and Brad Hayes were the ones that brought up our board action on the EVA, uh, Save EVA Airfield, Marine Field. Um, I received an email today of a pertinence that I wanted to bring on the line at the community concerns level. Thank you. There's, there's a two-tiered protected status and a, and a, and a, and a restoration status. By the protected status, we can still hold those over the, over the field. So I was going to bring it up. Thank you. Good. Excellent. On the same page. Okay. Um, Scott, you got anything for traffic or hopeful? Correct.
coverage for this last month, I was not able to attend. Um, we have audience members who may have been there. Anything that you would want to, if I can yield some time to you, anything you want to share from that meeting? Yeah, well, uh, Brendan is going to come here tonight, right? He's on the agenda for the first night, I no, that was the last month he was here. Oh, oh, oh then he's on the camp or something. He's yeah. going everywhere. Um, what they're basically doing is um, Brennan is going, the DOT director is going everywhere, in every meeting that there is, saying that uh, Fort Weaver Road is ADA compliant. And he, he's saying it over, over and over and over and over. He is saying it. Yes, he is saying this over and over and over, as if redundancy will make it so. We all know that there's no sidewalks leading to the bus stops. If, from the UMPO meeting? This is from the UMPO meeting. This is discussed by yeah, the UMPO this, this was it. We, kept the we, we, we brought up the uh, EBA, um, Eva Express, you know, the E Express, having all the milk runs, you know, to Waikoku. We ask that the Waikoku milk runs be eliminated and the Eva Express be an Eva Express. <coughs> just tonight, uh, this does have to do with young people. Just tonight, in taking the E Express, the enunciator for all the handicapped people, especially the blind people, announces Eva Library. Where it announces at a library is OLPH Church, three blocks away. And when it lets the disabled off at the church, when it's announcing that it's the library, there's no ADA access to get from the church to the library. It's all potholes and water-filled potholes and in and out of the street and everything like that. So it's in direct contradiction to the UMPO testimony of uh, the DOT director, to the DOT director's uh, testimony before the other day went forward, to the DOT director's testimony before the Committee on Accessible Transportation. Uh, so um, that was kind of like the highlight. Except uh, we have a new uh, chairman for um, Citizen Advisory Committee. Avon Akawa is the new chairman. And our previous chairman, when the members of uh, the CAP had voted on the agenda items and prioritized them, our previous chair disregarded the entire vote of the Citizens Advisory Committee and only put on the agenda only what he wanted on the agenda. So our new chairman, uh, which presided for the first time last month, did a really bang up excellent job. We're now getting uh, items on the agenda with the members of this uh, CAC want on the agenda. So it was a real good one. Thank you. And then with respect to transport, uh, traffic and transportation, um, it would appear that we need to take some action in the regular meeting of time in this to follow up on traffic light and white model with respect to OP and E. And And also, we should be should we be considering taking action or at least seeking clarification from Mr. Morioka as to whether or not the bus is ADA required. I questioned that in the letter that I read. Okay. And I actually proposed that letter to the governor. We're waiting there. So yeah, that letter yeah. went out on the second, I believe, of August. A footnote: We added uh, paratransit Title Six and ADA uh, to be a regular part of the agenda for future camp meetings, and 
David Eric Conway said he's going to listen on the agenda every month as issues. Can you make compliance? Paratransit, Title VI, Environmental Justice, and ADA. Uh, Lord Member Belford, uh, one of the things that I would like it if you would engage upon instigating is that the traffic study of 2002, I believe, conducted by the Department of Transportation had done a physical count whether or not the community traffic signal was warranted or not. I believe, to my understanding, this community has never gotten that vehicle number count, whereby we can deduce 12,000 more homes at Old Peely, and whether or not we were two cars short an hour getting that light put in, or a thousand cars short per hour getting that light as being warranted. And I would appreciate it if you would consider communications, uh, or if it has to be through the board of itself, through the chair, I think that is something of a vital tool that will be necessary for all future deliberations of this board to know what that results were of that vehicle traffic count of the warrants. We are clueless in my opinion. Will you be able to get that traffic count? We can see the actual report with a specific question of how close the numbers were to either warranting or rejecting this light. What will trigger it, if I may ask? What will trigger the traffic signal from being implemented? What's the trigger? I'm going to come off and put that to the person in the back of the screen. Uh, so I think if, if the chair would permit that, we could probably grab that letter to go through the chair um, and just see the answer to that question. I think that's good measure for us to have the uh, action and uh, that's the you know, first row in the uh, uh, all committees right now. So we're suggesting we bring before the normal meeting. I don't know if we need to use a letter or a question. I mean, if it's for the funding objective, it's for Scott Belton. You can do it on your own if it's on, on behalf of this board. Right. It needs to be on each night's agenda. We can't decide to do all the the all committee cannot take action on it. It'd be great to put that on tonight's agenda and roll just briefly and I'll bring that up as part of my report and uh, request that we uh, uh, thank you. Uh, have the language at that point. So we know we're going to And the key action items that we need to really make sure that we take are by by night seven. There was a question that the board member Burr brought up about uh, our testimony on the land use commission, but we're past that. There's no action to be taken there is, is no longer relevant. Instead, we want to focus our concerns on this traffic light and our the of knowledge. And so, the first step would be metric. <coughs> But, Mr. Chair, I think that the issue of OP should be brought up as a serious discussion. We're changing issues now. First was the first was the road down the lights. We haven't had a full discussion over OP since uh, since they started. People in Montecito started approving that uh, that project. We haven't had a serious discussion. Now we're changing issues, issues that should have been brought up in a, in a regular discussion. The dialogue with, with the developer, with the city and the state. Now we're just chasing. We're chasing. Little, little, little fractions we're chasing. And we don't see the total picture. Yeah, we keep getting pieces of it. Yeah, that's, that's the problem. I think, to me, I think uh, um, it's a done deal, the way you guys look at it. But it, it'll, be, it'll be affecting us for years to come. So, so unless we say to ourselves, you know, let's, let's get a full picture. A blown-up picture, and, and sit down with the developer and everything else. The thing is going to, you know, it's going to, it's going to size like us. I would say, Mr. Chair, that unfortunately we're constrained by the process. So it's our duty to understand the whole process. This well, what process? Well, what process? We never had a full discussion. The people on Emerald Beach, the, the, the ones that will be fully affected, seriously affected, we haven't had any kind of uh, dialogue or, or discussion whether we should go along with the project or not. Okay. In my mind, I think, I, I think we're just, uh, you know, we're, we're just up here in the air, trying try to kind of resolve it in our mind, yes, yeah, a good project or not project. But then you guys will come up with little, little tidbits that, that don't, 
don't fit the picture at all. I think that it's important that the dealer take action. And unfortunately, in the capacity of the board, if I may, Mr. Chair, we don't have the opportunity of just. We have to have feeling constraints, which is what can we do? What positions can we do? What can, we, what can we do? This is this is all lip service, what you guys sending letter, correspondence, actively engage in a discussion. We haven't had that. But now it's gone. You know, like you say, well, uh, we're not privy to all the information, we just uh, you know, we're just going about a process now. This is not true. But it's not true, you just said that. Scotty, you just sit there. Now, now, now the process has started. Now we're going to do. We're going to interject into the project the way we feel personally. Lights, roads, what else? Public facilities. It's all done deal. It's a done deal. What else you going to propose? If they say we got that things already, it's been proposed. You know, I, I don't think we know everything, but I don't know that anything's a done deal except for No, no. The way you guys are straggling along, you know. Picking up things that from the air and trying to make a sense out of it. You guys are just chasing whatever issues that you guys think is in your mind. Um, and so then I would say that uh, that would include my uh, report slash dialogue. Uh, um, presentation is a good thing, but this evening I believe we have a, uh, as a part of community concern and dialogue about this piece of property. And um, as best I understand in democracy, we have a process that's ongoing and we as the process, we never started the process. Now it's, it's missing us. Now we want to go back and say, look, we want to interject all these all these items to the project. This is getting kind of metaphysical, but I think we're in the process. That's the neighborhood board meeting tonight, and we're taking action on those things we can take action on, and it'll be good to get into the regular meeting. Okay. There's no direct statement. I can make support of my support, Mr. Chair. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask uh, Gary if you have any. Are you not on the committee? Do you have anything for your committee report? Um. Sorry, I had to cut you off real quick. Okay. okay. It, it's not much. I would just like to understand more than the community that I'm starting off an educational committee. And I've made, as you may know, there are six elementary groups in our community, and I've made contact with all except two of the principals were on my own. And I was anxious enough to meet with the principal for the new and the principal. Okay, uh, no objection. We will adjourn the uh, all committee meeting and check on our form. Thank you. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. oh we got a few minutes. All right, well, let's go ahead and turn this one and we'll get prepared for the meeting.
Pharaoh. Oh, that's my buddy. Yeah, but he wrote me when he went by one point, so that's that we were running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I talked to him all the time, and both of them were working in the country. With Willie and I, we didn't work together. Yeah, we didn't work together. I'm not that guy. Issue to the homeowners to fix it on. 
burn rubbish. It's for the pollution, yeah. Air pollution laws. Okay, any, any other board members? Comments, questions? Okay, uh, any comments, questions from the community? Oh, they just Sir, uh, right up there in front of you. You know, we used to uh, have emus for our uh, uh, barbecues, and um, uh, it, it's uh, uh, seeking permission to still applies today. For the emus, for the lighting of the emus. Down to your place and ask for. They just call that number. Call that number. 523 4411. Give the location of the. Right. They're going to ask for the location and then they're going to ask you about what time you're going to light it. Uh, but they want you to call okay. 10 minutes before, not way ahead. Because if you call way ahead and. They must get No. The reason is. <laughs> But emo, the thing set off a lot of smoke, right? So if you say, yeah, I'm going to start an emo fire in about half an hour. But then we see smoke in the area. They can be calling, hey, they want fire. They want a real fire going on. And they can say, oh, you know what? The alarm bear would say, that's the emo fire in that area. So they let you call right before you light them so they know that's the emo fire. That's the reason. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Okay, well, um, uh, use the mic, please. Well, Thank you. Go ahead. Go ahead, talk on <laughs> okay, I live uh, right behind Campbell High School, and then uh, my neighbors, I woke up at. I've been to your house, I know what you're going to say already. Well, you know, <laughs> was it you? Yes, it was me. Well, I'm having to go and I have to die because they, the neighbors were, bur were through a cigarette. See, I investigated. They called you guys, but they didn't call me. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, well, 9 o'clock, 9 30, and my house was full of smoke and I couldn't breathe, so I got up looking for the fire, and my house was full of smoke. The neighbors next door had a bunch of rubbish in the back, three or four mattresses, plastic containers, and they were all on fire. So we had to call the fire department because I was gagging and choking, and they had to call the ambulance because I needed oxygen. They went to the hospital, I said, no. They called the fire department and the police, and they denied it. The next day, I went on and investigated, because you know, I almost died. And, thank goodness for you guys and the, and the ambulance uh, paramedics, they were great. But, I went and investigated, and I found cigarette butts in the corner, and then I called uh, the, these people are living there, they're guests of the owner, I've known the owner for 30 years. Trying to get to your question. Well, I found cigarette butts, and I told the guy, hey, there's, you know, somebody, through these cigarette burn, the cigarettes here, that's why the mattresses caught on fire. And those mattresses are still there, there's still a potential hazard. And he said, well, it's the kids that come through the alley and they probably threw the cigarette butts. And then I went further up the, on the other and side of my dog. question room. is, okay. question please. Well, I'll get to it. Okay, you gotta get right to but it it's though. Important we got to you know what, this happened to me, it could happen to somebody else, and somebody I, could I, die. I understand, I, I understand, but okay. you need to move on. But now what happened was, I Summarize, went please. 10 cigarette butts, and I would like for you to come and, and cite those people that they still have the mess. And I kept the butts, the cigarette butts. Tell I'm familiar with that incident. Um, just that night, uh, her house was full of smoke. And I called for the Honolulu Police Department. They came down and they looked to arrest someone for that incident because it was an unauthorized fire. It's a rubbish pile in the neighbor's yard, and they were unsupervised. So we did try to we did try to um, mitigate that with the police department. I don't know what came of it. After our job was done, we left, and uh, Honolulu Police Department uh, took it from there. Thank you. I commend you guys. You guys were great. We got that. Okay. Fire. Thank you. But, but Any other uh, ma'am? Ma'am, please. I have ten cigarette butts. Hello. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you have any other further discussion, I'd like for you to take it outside Thank with you, the okay. officer. Thank you. Okay. The any other? Uh, <laughs> any other comments for uh, HP uh, Fire Department? <laughs> okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. HPD. Looking at Jack Rochelle, I'll be going over the crime statistics and uh, congratulations to the new board members also. Thank you. For the, um, the month of July, there were no, well, 
There were no murders or manslaughters or sexual assaults reported. However, there was one murder that occurred in June. There was one sexual assault reported in June. There, were, there was one robbery reported in the month of July. There were two reported in June. There were 39 burglaries occurring or reported during the month of July. There were 21 reported in June. There were 22 UEMB, unauthorized entry to motor vehicle uh, cases or incidents reported in July. 11 were reported in June. 14 auto thefts reported in July. 16 were reported in June. There were 36 thefts reported in July. 21 reported in June. There were 25 property damage reports or cases reported in July. There were 26 reported in June. There were 59 motor vehicle collision incidents reported in July. There were 65 reported in June. There were a total of 1,731 calls for service in, during the month of July. 1,675 reported or uh, made in June. Total arrests for District 8 in July. There was 463 arrests affected. Of that number, there were 371 adults and 92 juveniles arrested as compared to 539 arrests affected during the month of June. Total police calls for service for the entire district during the month of July. There was 6,357 calls, 6,084 in June. Prime message of the month, to all neighborhood security watch members on September 20th, HPD will be having a Neighborhood Security Watch Family Fun Day at the White Waters Adventure Park in Couple A. This event was the brainchild of Officer Anton Tony Pacheco, CPT officer for the Couple A Station, to honor our Neighborhood Security Watch members and their families. Tony has worked tirelessly to make this event come true. Neighborhood Security Watch members will be given discounted prices off of admission. If you are interested in attending, uh, you need to RSVP by September 13th. And for more information, you can contact the CPT officer, Tony Pacheco, Officer Halani Barboza, and Officer Michael Kaikina. Okay, thank you. Board members, a question? Oh. Sure. Sir, could you um, define the line for me or clarify for me between robbery, burglary, and theft? To me, they all mean the same. So could you kind of define it for me, please? Burglaries occur when somebody enters unlawfully into a residence or a building to commit some kind of crime, like a hole or um, any kind of, somebody could come in here and commit a crime. It could be anything, it could be theft, it could be to assault somebody, it could be to damage something, that's a burglary. Robbery is when a is, is confrontational. It's when a person actually goes up to another person and um, uses physical force or threat of force to steal something from that person. That's a robbery. Yeah, and, and, uh, for instance, bank robberies, uh, store robberies, uh, that type of thing. Uh, theft is just simple uh, stealing something that, that doesn't belong to you. Um, could be, you know, Property could be money, could be actually physical taking, could be using, could be electronically, uh, using computers. Uh, that's step. So therefore, if somebody comes in into my house or your house unauthorized, that is a burglary. And if they confront, you see them and. He said, hey, what are you doing in my house and he threatened you? That's a burglary and robbery. If somebody enters your house unlawfully and doesn't do anything, that's a trespass. If they enter your house unlawfully to commit a crime like threatening you, they say, and you tell me hey, what you're doing in my house, and then they threaten to do harm to you, you have a terroristic threatening and a burglary. Because he's doing two, two crimes. He's entering unlawfully in with the intent to commit a crime, which is a burglary, and he's also um, threatening you. So that's actually two offenses in one incident. Thank you. Confusing. <laughs> it's very confusing. That's why lawyers argue these things for a long time. Before. Okay. Uh, any other board members? Um, just I was, I was just wondering if. You know any statistics? I mean, this came up about, uh, let's say, about three, four months ago about uh, the schools within uh, Edema and Cabo about fights 
um, I see juvenile arrests, but I was wondering if that take into account um, with that, you know, um, with my daughter going out of the to go almost to, you know, to Lima. I was wondering on these fights, I, I'm still hearing that there, every day there's a fight at Lima, you know. So I was just wondering on the, on what's going on. I, I, I don't have um, an accurate figure for you concerning those incidents. I only can relate to you what I have observed uh, because I work on the evening shift and we start work at 2. So from the evening on, I personally noticed a significant reduction in the number of calls in the afternoon to these juvenile fights at the schools uh, as compared to last year, um, April, May, June, towards the ending of the school year when we were having almost daily. I mean, every week something was happening. Uh, I, I did notice that there were maybe a few incidents in the past I'd say a few weeks off campus. Uh, we've had calls to arguments at Burger King, uh, in local juveniles, calls at Hulu Park, uh, juveniles um, congregating there looking like they're arguing and it might be escalated to a fight. But uh, it, it wasn't anything serious, as serious as what we had experienced uh, last year. And when officers had gotten there, uh, no one was actually fighting, only saw was juveniles just leaving the area once, once the police arrived. So. Then probably we um, just make sure that everybody just went home safely. And I would just like to thank all you officers for what you guys are doing. Thank you very much. Since uh, they said you uh, do you work the night shift, um, if it's possible, can you uh, request the day shift officers in these times that we're talking about the fighting and um, so that the kids in our area can be protected? Because what we found out is that these guys are coming from other schools, They're causing these fights. And uh, you know, what can we do as community members um, for, the, for the community? And what we can do to help you guys, or, or to find out what we can do to stricken the laws on kids that come from other communities and ca cause um, adult crimes in the sense of not only sexual harassment to sex assaults, to attempted rape, hijacking, and mobbing. Um, these crimes are very serious. It's not little kitty crimes that they're doing, taking color crayons in elementary. These are big crimes. What can we do as a community? Because it seems like our community is drawing all these other communities to come and do these assaults and these crimes in our community. For whatever reason, I don't know. But if you can, um, I would request you guys, if you guys can kind of beef up the police in the area during those times. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else on the board? Okay, anybody from the community got any questions for HPD? Uh, uh, one one way. Thank you. I understand some other community that have patrolmen on bicycle around the school end. Even though we got a big project community with a condominium area, they used to drive a ride on the bicycle. Now, what is the budget for the next year for you guys to start putting people, officers, in bicycle in the area of the peak area in the morning? Because I hear a lot of complaints. I got foster kids that come into Campbell, and when they come to my house, they say, Dad, they got people selling drugs right in front of the park before you even go to school. And then many, many occasions they've been selling me this. Now, if you can put somebody over there, on the bicycle, on the court, or maybe you can stop that kind of crime because they do happen, but they never you never see it on your statistics. But they happen almost every day. People go there selling drugs in front of the school. Uh, bicycle patrols are, are very um, and a very effective means to combat crime. Um, mainly, mainly for those reasons you already mentioned that um, they uh, have a little bit of. I don't know if you can call it stealth, but they don't attract a lot of attention when a police car would pull up to a scene or a motorcycle. Or they don't make a lot of noise, so they can actually stroll up to somebody committing crime like doing drugs, selling drugs, without the person, the suspect, actually knowing that. And that has proven very effective in other areas like downtown and other districts. Um, and at one time, uh, there was a bicycle patrol in this district that this was before I was actually signed to this particular area. Um, however, um, I, I would 
probably have to be honest with you and, and let you know that the probability of us being able to put together a bike detail is very, very small because I'm sure all, all, everybody in this room have heard that the city has already asked a three percent, at least a three percent reduction in budget for the coming years. So that means not only do we have to make do with what we have, which is most times not enough, now we're going to learn to make do with less, which to be honest with you, uh, it's going to be very challenging in the next at least two more years. <coughs> okay, real quick. Yeah. I understand even for the handicap, you got volunteer people, the volunteers to, to do the job and give the people citation to, uh, to the people that violate the rule. Why the city don't come up with such a volunteer patrolman without getting paid, but do almost exactly what you guys do without carrying the weapon, but to identify and apprehend the person that's selling the drug right there in front of it. I know they say a lot of legality and a lot of logic will fight the patrolman, but if you start it the first time, like you started the neighborhood watch with the people with the red beret, maybe we can get something accomplished. Uh, on the surface, that type of idea probably would look uh, very um, enticing. However, in practice, you have a lot of, like you already mentioned, a lot of liability issues. I mean, fully trained police officers, I mean, that's all we think of. I mean, uh, well, I should say that's all we think of. That's um, uh, one of the very important issues that we have to be cautious of in enforcing laws and in interacting with people. We've got to think about liability, we've got to think about civil rights. We gotta think about constitutional rights, we gotta think about state constitutional law, federal constitutional law, juvenile law, state traffic law. So it's, it's not as easy or as simple as you would want it to be because there's a lot of different issues involved that the average lay person that you kick off the street to try to be a, a cop, uh, most times it's, it's not a good idea. There's too many um, liabilities, too many important things you gotta think about. You can't, police cannot just go and say, oh, that guy doing crime, I wouldn't, I wouldn't arrest him. You gotta, you gotta know what you're doing, you gotta know how to do it, you gotta be properly trained, and it's hard to do with the average person on the street. Yeah. Okay, um, wait, I have a um, follow up on the board member, and then I'll let you talk, and then we'll move on. So, since we're we talking about the 3% and the reduction in costs, to put out a patrol that this gentleman just asked about, his bicycles. What would be the daily cost just in that time frame that we're talking about? I mean, oh. That's a kind of rough figure. Because if we can get some people, maybe get together and maybe buy four bikes to according to what the police specification is, um, would you guys be able to fill that positions if that's, that's part of the cost? I, I don't think the equipment is, is, is would be the uh, main factor that would progress on. I think it's, it's personnel. We just don't have the personnel available. Um, and, and to make the personnel available, we would have to take away. Take away from traffic, take away from the schools, you know. We gotta take from someplace. Right. So, what do we take? We don't wanna take away from the kids, they're kinda important. We don't wanna take, about, take away from traffic concerns. I think that's the main thing everybody wild about, is traffic help. So, it's trying to manage your resources Prioritizing what is most important. I think okay, traffic is really important. People are frustrated. We gotta, you know, make sure that the traffic is flowing. Uh, the schools are important. We gotta make sure the kids are, are, are safe in school. So uh, it is kind of difficult. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Very um, answer. Thank you. Okay, statistics show that California is the number one state with the most trafficking in drugs. And the number two state of highest level of drugs, traffic, and everything uh, is Hawaii. And if you think that it's easy to approach somebody that's on drugs, I've seen it in the school, these people and the kids are not in their right senses, they'll attack you, okay. and you'll, very, so it's very dangerous. Yeah, I just need you to get to the question. And just, okay, thank you. Just a comment. Sorry, we're trying to do question and answers and move right on through. Yeah, but it just okay. seems like an ice peak, you know, you all want to cut me off. No, 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 everybody, okay, did, did you hear the time limit advertised in the beginning of the meeting? I think you go past the time limit. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, uh, thank you, sir. Oh, sorry, one more minute.
Um, Perry Chen, um, I don't know where the statistics came from, but um, I don't think we're the second highest rated crime in the city, so. Um, officer, you have a question for that? Because we just got back to being the second highest drug city in the in in so city. So can, can you respond if we are any close to that? You know, I, I, I really cannot give you an accurate or correct answer. I'm trying to get that next one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the reason why I'm saying is that people want to and we have to have it correct. You know, okay, you know, um, I, I think it's safe to say we're not number two in any kind of crime. Right. Whether it be drugs, violent crime, we were fairly high in property crime, but even that figure has been coming down in the past couple of years. So I, I think I can fairly and accurately say that no, we're not number two. I don't think in anything right now. Okay, all right, good. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Okay, fine. Fine. Okay, we're on a freeze frame right now. Okay, is we can as to what the status is for Evan Beach getting signage that says you're entering a B and C district. We, do, we did uh, provide the signs to the city. Um, so, Sergeant, in fact, Sergeant Evan is calling up for that. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any other board member questions for we and see? Kurt? Um, Friday was Saturday, you need members from the area is going to be doing another... Uh, Take a phone, please. Another uh, speed uh, waving sign in the area. So, um, so that's going to be like a pulley, parkway, and a peeping road. Um, so that's probably Friday, but I think Friday might be on holiday, somebody said. So if it is, we're going to probably do it on Saturday. A couple of parkway and uh, a peeping. Uh, we're going to be there uh, Saturday, would be 10 o'clock. And then if it's on Friday, it will be 3 o'clock. Right. So the, the seating effort, uh, we will be having a make a difference day, uh, we need clean up, a doctor block on August 23rd, and we're asking for volunteers to meet by uh, Cabo High School Bowl building, the biker parking lot. Um, sign, sign up is done for 8 o'clock in the morning. Okay, that was, uh, I'm sorry, the parking lot, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Any uh, other questions from the board? Uh, community, any questions for community? Uh, we see. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, board of water, board of water supply. Cal. Uh, good evening, board members and all my neighbors. Um, Cal Suyo from the board of water. Um, for the month of July, uh, we had no water main breaks in this area. Uh, for a general water announcement, the Board of Water Supply, along with the Department of Environmental Services and the Commission on Water Resource Management, has extended the low flow flush toilet rebate program to at least June 30th of 2009. If you are connected to the city sewer or water system and replace an existing non ultra flow toilet, three gallons or more per flush, to an ultra low flush toilet, 1.6 gallons or less per flush, you could qualify for a hundred dollar rebate. For more details about this program, you can visit uh, www.boardofwatersupply.com. And I have two FYIs. Um, first is the Board of Water Supply pumps an average of 150 million gallons of water per day. And the second is the Board of Water Supply maintains a water system that includes approximately over 2,000 miles of pipes, four shafts, 12 tunnels, and 48 well stations. Um, and that concludes my report. 
For last last month, there was a concern about our temporary fire hydrant meters in the area, and I did give the I did finally get the answers to that, and I did give um, a copy of this uh, information to the person who asked it. But whoever else wants information regarding the temporary fire hydrant, you can see me later because it'll be a long report to read. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, board members, any questions? Community. Any questions for uh, Board of Water? Um, Cal put out the questionnaire, uh, which was community concerns, probably uh, last month and the previous months. It says over here, Cal, and, and you made this print out, I quote, there's 10 projects in this area. Albert Kobayashi. Alvin Kobayashi, Gentry Builders, Robin Contracting, Delta Con Construction, Hawaiian Dredging, Paseco Eva, JR, Gentry Builders, and Okada Trucking. On the average, so, so there's 10, 10 contractors in this area. And you have 40 over here. Each month, each contractor uses 620,000 gallons. 620,000 gallons. I know what it says here is the amount of water used at each temporary meter is different for each project. But for the current meters we have, 17, so we have 17 temporary fire hydrants in this area, the average monthly water consumption for each project ranges from zero to 620,000 gallons per month. So times 10, we're talking about 6 million. There's 17 temporary fire hydrants in the area. Yeah, but you said the average contractor uses 620,000 gallons a month. Okay, let's, uh, let's make so, that. So, Mr. Chair, yeah. times 10, 6.2 million gallons a month of portable water. Portable. You and I drink from it. Uh, is there any way they can come back and use non-portable water? Oh, uh, yes. Oh, like I said earlier, uh, the average it says here is zero to 620, not 620,000 gallons average. And, um, but we are, in this area, uh, non-portable or recycled water uh, is being used for dust control by the contractors when available. However, brackish and recycled water is not available yeah. everywhere. Yeah, you don't have to read the whole thing. Okay. Uh, I think we got the point real quick. I got some uh, 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 You said there's no uh, brackish water or non-portable water in this area that they can use? Okay. Uh, so okay, we go. I've been with the Eva Gentry Association and they do have the, the non portable water. Now, in some time, they diminish to use the pump and to use for the grass and all the other irrigation system. Why they cannot go back to the system to supply the water for those contractors? Because the pump are available. If you look at every one of those uh, townhouses, like a farm court, all the ones, they do have the the, the pump system, and for some reason whatsoever before, they say that they will drain the supply of the water. But immediately, without using it over 10 years, that means the sources should be full already for them to be drawing that water from that particular place. I got okay. that, I got that uh, The statistics that you bring in here and you bring into the community, yeah. Delta Construction and Gentry does use a lot of recycled water and brackish water. They use the water from our ocean with big massive pumps. If you look at their trucks, they're all rusty and bust up. It's due to the uh, portable water that they're using, especially on Oseco's property and on Gentry's property. So some of these we're talking about, the reason why they use this water is because they have to clean the road and it's all in public area. So these waters that they're using on site gotta be only on site. They cannot use it on uh, public area because one, if I splash this water that I'm getting out of the ocean on your car, we will liable for a suit. That's the reason why they're using um, uh, uh, clean water. 
so it doesn't uh, hurt the environment and it doesn't hurt the community that they're using it in. It doesn't use this clean water to go dust control out there, out there in Hoseco. They use non portable water. Okay, thank you. Then, the thing that strikes me funny, Mr. Chair, is that they're using portable water, our regular drinking water, and then he states in his letter that we as citizens got to curb the water usage. We got to curb. So the directive needs to be towards the uh, developers to curb their actions. That's correct, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So, so Cal, um, can you go back and, and try to make some kind of amends so that we in the community kind of feel comfortable that we're not splurging, you, the, the contractors are not splurging the water. You know, using foolishly. Um, then, you know, on the panel, what, what I gave you, if you look on number four, yeah. there's an answer to that question. Okay, but I think you express it to the community. Because from the from the 620 gallons, 1,000 gallons, then you go back into the community. But we want to we keep on track with the developers okay, and the contractors. Thank you. Yes, Celeste. Um, I, is this working? Okay, I believe we had requested last month to have a breakdown on the water consumption that, that each contract is used. And we don't see, I don't see anything here. Um, what they did was, the if they just gave an average, it says. Yeah, uh, yeah. you got an average of um, um, bundling up all 10. Companies, and that's not what we wanted. What I want for the, every, re the reason for that is because right. last month we specified only two subdivisions, two contractors, uh, good fellow and another person. But you didn't specify all these other ones that we did have questions on. Now, we did find, and my husband and I did see, this contract is using water from the fire hydrant washing down their trucks, which does a no-no. You know, so uh, if you can, you know, bring back and, and see, because we want to save our water. We don't want to, you know, waste our water for something that is, you know, whatever. But we, oh, but we no, requested Pastor. last month if you could bring it in. Okay, okay. Well, okay. hopefully we'll get the answer for you in the next meeting. Yeah, maybe, uh, maybe Cal can do a follow-up on that and uh, definitely bring it to the next meeting a little bit more detail. Uh, then we will be able to capture all the uh, questions that everybody's at. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. If nothing else from the community, thank you. Okay. Uh, military is Lieutenant Colonel or Lieutenant Commander available? Not in DC. Okay. Let's move right along then. Going into announcements. Um, those that have your agendas, and uh, of course there's some agendas on the table there. Um, precinct officials, I think they're still in need of um, assistance for voters um, in your community or in our community. Uh, September 4, I'm sorry, 4, September 20th and November 4th. And what you can do is contact the uh, elections uh, uh, people over there. And if you have a pencil available, it's 453 vote and that equates to 8683 or you can go online to uh, www.hawaii.gov forward slash elections. Okay, I have one other announcement. Um, actually, on the planes, uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, they have their um, newspaper out. Uh, it was distributed out. I believe there's some other issues on the table over there. Uh, they're also looking for uh, articles and ads about your community. So if you guys have something going on out there and you feel like the rest of the community needs to know, uh, please make contact with uh, Denise and her team over there and get things going. <coughs> okay. Um, we have another announcement. Um, we're going to hold a special candidate's form in October and through the uh, uh, conversation that I had with the all committees uh, meeting earlier this evening, um, Member Belford is going to be conducting or in charge of conducting a uh, uh, question and answer, correct? Question, question and answer uh, form next Qu month. All right, question and answer form 
for next month for uh, all those that are running for the primary or before the primary. Uh, we're only looking at delegating approximately an hour to an hour and a half max um, for a uh, question and answer period. Uh, letters will go out to uh, those candidates that will be running for the primary. And then after the primary, on the October candidates form, this will be held as a special meeting right here in this room. And um, uh, I need to ask the community if there are um, concerns or issues that you would like to bring up. In fact, what I'm trying to do is gather questions from the community and from the board members uh, that will be presented at the October form, candidate form. So if you can uh, write your uh, uh, questions down and we will address them to the candidates uh, during the October form. And uh, each candidate will have the same question and we'll probably pick one. But at this point we're thinking seven questions, depending on the time and the number of people that we have to deal with. Okay, so uh, for the community and for the board members, next month, September's board meeting, uh, I would like to start collecting questions. I would like to have legible questions. If you can type them, great. If you can write them, please print. I have bad eyes. And I want to make sure we can read your question for the candidate form. Okay? Uh, Scott, you got anything else to say for September site? Got the, uh, got ourselves a little total here for um, our practice in democracy next month. For our Congressional District 1, we'll have uh, four candidates we'll be inviting. Um, for uh, State Representative District 42, we have uh, five candidates we'll be inviting. Uh, District 43, State Representative, not contested in the primary, and can't be decided in the primary as the mayor and uh, city council races can be, so we will um, not be engaging those candidates. Uh, we will be inviting nine candidates for Honolulu mayor, and uh, the two candidates for Honolulu city council. For those who may or may not know, the council and the mayor races are nonpartisan. And should a candidate harn, uh, garner more than, I believe, 50% of the votes, there is no need for this to go to the general. So it's of importance that uh, all candidates seeking your support and your commitment to this thing called democracy have a chance to come before you. And we are affording them that opportunity next month as part of our regularly scheduled board meeting. So there will be two opportunities before now in November for you to participate in asking and seeking answers from those who seek your vote. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Scott. Uh, quick clar clarification, uh, Board Member Belford. In the uncontested uh, primaries, for those that are going straight to the general, uh, my comment would be that they would be inclusive uh, in that uh, September's meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you got two, uh, you had a question on that? Are you going to name the who is being invited now? Or could you name them, please, for the audience? Who, who the 42, the five candidates, the 43, the four candidates, and and the uh, city council and the mayor? Absolutely. And, and this document is being prepared, will, of course, be passed on to the secretary so that these can be sent out. Um, for uh, uh, Congressional District 1, Abercrombie, Amsterdam, uh, Tatao, and Zhao. Uh, District 42, State Representative Bird, Bembo, Cabanilla, Arakawa, Rodriguez, and Schultz. Um, it, it would appear that Board Member Berg has asked us to, uh, uh, to not rule out entertaining candidates for District 43. Those are Favela and Pine. Honolulu Mayor, those nine candidates are Cunningham, uh, David Nagan, Hanneman, Campbell, Kobayashi, Mali, Manor, Nita, Prevedoros, and for City Council, that would be Apo and Smith. Uh, mailing addresses as submitted to the Office of Elections or what will be used for our mail out. Um, those who are watching television or using the telephone, um, this is also the beginning of the announcement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Clarify. Mr. Chair, can I, can I ask one question on, on the, I want to know the format, because 
Right now, as I counted, it, it's 42 candidates. If they do an introduction, which means if you gave them an introduction, you'll have 22 minutes, a minute of peace. If you ask some questions, um, three minutes question, that's 60 minutes. So, so I, I, I think so between the delays and the time they, you know, the amount of time they answer the questions, I think you gotta, you gotta go beyond the 90 minutes a lot of time, maybe, maybe, maybe two hours. We will be using this thing with great effectiveness. Okay. And so what we'll be doing uh, next month is we'll be encouraging um, candidates to speak for one minute to one minute only. And our questions will be limited to um, one minute. Um, 30 seconds for the question, and then we'll go to the answer. The idea is to engage, um, as our good audience member has requested. The same audience member is always eager to see an engagement with officials, so we'll take what we get within that context, and mainly we're going to have it as part of the regular meeting. So for, for those friends in the television audience who may not be able to get here, also have a chance to learn. So it's all about this, and we'll be real quick and efficient because that's the name of the game. Okay, uh, what, more questions? No? Okay, uh, let me hit these two and then you go. Okay. All right, two more, uh, uh, two more announcements real fast. Um, I received a uh, information from State uh, Civil Defense in reference to uh, all hazard outdoor warning signs. And uh, real briefly, the State Civil Defense is conducting a island-wide project to upgrade and or replace all hazard outdoor warning signs. Various neighborhoods will receive new or upgraded sirens and will, and we would like to, or they, would like to take this opportunity to present uh, the project to any interested neighborhood boards. Now, upon that request, uh, I did ask them if they could come out uh, next month and uh, make a presentation. Uh, it will not be more than 10 minutes, so it will not interfere with uh, the uh, question and answer period for the candidates. Okay, so um, uh, I have also asked uh, Civil Defense uh, uh, to engage in some a couple of questions that uh, we had earlier on in some of our earlier board meetings in reference to Eva Beach being a you know, flood zone area and uh, what we need to do to get in that area or, or take care of things out here. So uh, Civil Defense will visit us next month. Okay. And in reference to the, um, this is my last action here, in reference to the elections that are obviously on the table, uh, I got from the uh, Neighborhood Board uh, Commission, uh, reference to the do's and don'ts, and I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but uh, in first sentence it just says, it's important that neighborhood boards not endorse or give or imply endorsements or, uh, <clears throat> endorsement or support for any candidates for elected office and to prevent this, to prevent any possible challenges, they're recommending a couple different actions. Each of the board members have those, uh, or this same letter, so again, I'm not gonna read it through, but just wanna let you know that we're trying to be proactive in that sense to make sure that we are on the legality side of what we're doing with the elections. Okay, Tom. Last month, this board unanimously supported taking action to advance saving Eva Marine Corps Air Station when Mr. Brad Hayes gave a presentation. There's a quick update. Uh, these folks that are engaged in this activity are expecting an announcement from the White House between August 23rd and the 29th approximately. There are two actions of which the White House can take. One is a, a preserved status and a recognized status. And if you'd like to write a letter to the White House to encourage and be protected, protected keeps it from being bulldozed, the air station. If, it, however, the White House uh, makes a determination to be recognized as a national monument, that does not protect it from the bulldozers. So if you'd like to have more information, please contact our chair. Uh, it would be pertinent if you want to take a position to make sure the White House does a protected, preserved status, it would be encouraged. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, just as a reminder uh, to that particular uh, announcement, um, this board uh, did a resolution in support of the uh, EVA Field, EVA Airfield uh, Preservation, uh, which uh, has gone out and uh, hopefully uh, has some effect. Okay. Kurt? Oh. Okay.
Member Burke, did you say that we have to write to our, our, our people in, in, in Washington and to support this also? The action taken by uh, this board with the chair uh, providing this resolution, um, there's a little bit more detail, and that was that there's a dichotomy between, again, preserved, protected versus recognized. This was not, this was unbeknownst, unbeknownst to us at the time we took action last month, so it's being encouraged. A, this board can, can carry on and put it on the agenda tonight and follow through if they choose, but uh, that's why it's being brought forward. I mean, what about the, 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 um, the TV audience or anybody who wants to write to our what, uh, people at Washington is encouraged. Are they encouraged to do that too? Yes, one quick one. Um, Ava Beach uh, community is going to be blessed again with the opportunity of getting a chance to um, complete and do a sunset and it's going to be the location will be on North Road. Uh, right now we're looking for the nonprofit um, at this time, so it's going to be right across here um, um, sometime um, later on this year. So just wanted to make that announcement. Sunset on the Plains? Sunset on the Plains. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we're going to, uh, we chose the location from Hobosh um, due to some uh, public uh, concerns and issues. So now we're going to be trying it over here across the street over here at North Road at the community park. So everybody wants to get involved, uh, you know, stay tuned. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements? Board members? Community? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moving forward. Forward. Okay, we have um, public generated concerns um, from Kapolei resident on the whole Ely project, Mr. Dudley. Good evening, Mr. Chair and uh, board members. Uh, the people of Evan Beach. Uh, I'd like to talk to you tonight about uh, the whole Opini project. Um, this uh, is kind of a, a, a map. This uh, is the H1 freeway and this Fort Weaver Road, uh, Barrington Highway, and the, the area that we're talking about, North South Road over here. We're talking about the area that here is south of the freeway and uh, moving in that direction from uh, Fort Weaver Road. Well, uh, it is in this area that D.H. Uh, Horton and Schuler Homes uh, had a, a plan to put 12,000 to 13,000 houses. Um, they have come together with people in the community. They've uh, brought people together. They've brought people from outside. They've really studied it. They've come up with wonderful plans that engage uh, sustainability and uh, smart growth principles. And it's going to be one of the really great communities of our island. The problem with it, though, is that it's just simply in the wrong place. And, and, and we really can't afford to have it, and that's the other, other part of it. The first, of those re the first reason for this is because of agricultural lands. It's in going to cover over extremely important agricultural lands. In 1971, the university did a study of all the agricultural lands in Hawaii, graded them acre by acre, according to A, B, C, D, and E. And what we have here is the A and B lands, which are going to be covered over by the whole PD project. Now, at the time that the study was done, there were 53,000 acres. However, since that time, they've taken Minanani, they've taken Waipio, they've taken Waikele, they've taken um, Village Park, they've taken Royal and they've taken all of the land in Kapolei, that's A and B land, where about 40% of it is now gone. Now the A and B lands are really important, and the reason is there aren't many of them, okay? Uh, we have no A lands on the Big Island. We have no B lands on Molokai. We have no A or B lands on Lanai, Kaho'olawe, or Ni'ihau. So they really are important. And, and, and the, the, the thing that's really important about these lands particularly is they're not only A and B quality lands, but they sit down in the low area where they get good sunshine and an awful lot of rain, and they're extremely productive lands. Now, the reason we don't want to cover them over, Japan found the reason that they invaded uh, Manchuria before the Second World War was because they couldn't feed themselves. They had covered over their prime lands. 
and uh, they just simply had to go elsewhere to find more lands. <coughs> Now, because I don't expect all of you to be terribly upset about agriculture, though, I want to give you some other reasons why we can't afford to let these lands go to the whole beating project. And the first of them is traffic. You know um, your problems every day coming out headed towards town. And you head down Port Weaver Road and onto the freeway. And us folks come down H1, and we all meet right there. And this is the beginning of our tremendous problems once we get on the freeway for us, but your problems have been going on since you got on to Port Weaver Road, right? Okay. Now, where are these people going to come out? Well, there are 12,000 homes. How many homes is 12,000 homes? There are 14,000 homes in 96706. There are only 14,000 homes in all of 96706. They're going to double the number of homes that are here. And those homes are going to be right there on prime agricultural land, and the people in them are going to go to town for work just like you people go to town for work. They're going to come out onto Fort Weaver Road, they're going to come out onto this road, they're going to come out onto this road, but they're all going to wind up right there, okay? I'd really like to get together with you sometime and talk to you more about this. Let me tell you that I obviously don't have the time right now, unless the chair is going to give me a few more minutes. Uh, so let me take down all of these things and just tell you anyway that my name is Dr. Keone Dudley. If you would like to get together and let me work with you to help you work with me in stopping uh, the whole, uh, the whole Eden project, please get together with me by contacting me either by phone, 672-8888, or my email, which is drkeonedudley at hawaii.rr.com. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Board members? Uh, Tom? Very quickly. Uh, I provided comment for the draft environmental impact statement as an individual, and I have provided that letter dated March 27, 2008. I received a letter from PBR Hawaii, of uh, which my letter will be included into the final environmental impact statement document. And in that, uh, I had omitted uh, my knowledge of the Pueo Owl and the fact that in the state of Hawaii, on the island of Oahu only, the Pueo Owl is considered an endangered species. It has state protected status, not federal status. It's a ground nesting bird. So when you're talking about egg lands, I contacted the Department of Land and Natural Resources Forestry Division. And to my knowledge, they were never contacted and were not apprised of any studies or research as to this ground nesting endangered owl. Also, it was brought to my attention that if there's one nest found in that 1,600 acres, it could put a halt to this project in its entirety. Thank you. Scott. Thank you for that presentation. You were showing us a map that, as fate would have it, um, coincided with an all-committee discussion we had. It regards a traffic light that apparently has been approved on Fort Weaver Road, EVA of H1. Is Am I understanding correctly that there will be an additional traffic light um, once this property is built um, between the uh, hospital and H1? I can't tell you that. I don't know. Is that the hallway Yes. Yes. So I'm going by. So, okay. Is the board familiar with this? Yes. Mitchell? Just for clarification, when you were saying they own co I mean, um, YPO, going all the way down, all those places, who are they? Are you talking about? No, no, no. What I was saying was that those areas are all A and B lands, which are now covered over with houses. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't mean to say that any developer owned those. I, I just meant okay. to say that as, as since 1971, these are are really best lands are being taken, and we have to be careful. Mm -hmm. you know, those aren't there any left. Here. Oh, sorry, Kurt first. 
Dr. Darnley, could you clarify what A, B, C, D, E means? Yes, A and B are your really prime lands. C lands are the, the still good lands, though. So when you speak of the, the, the good lands, the really good lands, you're really talking about A, B, and C lands. And um, when you get down to D lands, you get into rocky lands, um, and um, you know, uh, problem areas in E lands are really bad. So uh, uh, um, you know, you're talking about hillsides, you're talking about uh, upper mountains, stuff like that. Bert? I just have a question. <coughs> Since he clarified the days, he's not saying there was any new developers like Shooter Homes. That wasn't a day, right? That's what he's saying. No. Um, there are, though. Uh, you know, there are more lands in um, uh, is it Waiau and in um, the upper the Montequilo area and so forth that are uh, right now being um, discussed and fought over uh, for development. The lands that was covered over in these different communities, um, was there was a reason, do you know if there was a reason why they, they went over some prime land specific to farm? Was it because of uh, economics or um, lack of uh, farming? Uh, do you know the, the logistics of that? Of why they had to go over A land? Because A land, what you're telling us right now, is hard to get. I mean, why would these communities commit such a crime if you say that it's a crime yeah. and, and not be heard to now? I mean, you know what I mean? Okay. I know that the Department of Agriculture has been really upset about what's been going on. I know that they've done their best to try to they get the word out. I know that uh, I know that they put up a big fight about White Kelly uh, because uh, there, there was so much prime land right in that area. But I think it's just a matter of, you know, it, it's just like us. I mean, nobody in the community has ever had the time to get in and find out about the A&D lands. Uh, uh, the, uh, nobody in the community has really stood up and gotten other people together to, to do something about it. And so, you know, they, uh, the lands were just taken, you know. And the, and the city council just allowed it to go. The, the Land Use Commission allowed it to go. Like the and they do that in the reverse in the afternoon. Um, the buses are dedicated to the service in case the boat does not run for any, any reason. Uh, the, the buses will provide direct links peer-to-peer -peer, um, non-stop as a backup. We did anticipate the possibility of that, or weather or mechanical, so we built that into the system. Um, the single eight and a half by 14 sheet that's being, that was handed out to the board members. Oh, and for the audience, I do have extra flyers up in the back there. Um, the, we're going to expand our bus service starting August 25th. That's when the new bus, uh, bus driver uh, schedule start. And we're going to be servicing an additional neighborhoods uh, in Kapolei, which is the uh, villages of Kapolei by the uh, golf course. Also the new Hawaiian Homes development, uh, Makai of Kapolei Parkway. And we're also going to extend our shuttle bus service on the leeward coast from uh, previous to that, where, where our terminus is the Wainai Transit Center, we're now going all the way out to Makaha, so no one has to transfer uh, buses along the leeward coast. They just can uh, board from Makaha all the way to the boat and get on the boat, so there's no stopping. In addition to that, we've retuned the Route 41 for the Ebo Beach residents, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to be on this meeting, because uh, the Route 41 is a Ebo Beach to Kapolei Transit Center link. And we retune the schedule, and those that's outlined in that eight and a half by fourteen sheet, so that uh, passengers that want to ride the boat, and about fifteen percent of the riders from uh, of the boat come from Ebo Beach. Uh, passengers that want to ride the boat from Ebo Beach, they will only they will have maybe about a five minute uh, transfer uh, at Kapolei Transit Center when currently our current schedule might be twenty minutes or thirty minutes between transfers. So those. We've retuned the schedules to allow for a shorter, shorter wait time and an easier transfer at uh, Kapolei Transit Center. Now the boat offers a, it's 149 passenger capacity. We offer three sailings in the morning and three sailings in the afternoon. It has uh, free Wi-Fi internet service, uh, and it was it's being provided by uh, Dr. Horton Schuler Homes uh, at uh, uh, as a donation to the city. Uh, we also offer a snack bar. We have bathrooms. It's a very upgraded service to catching the bus. If you get on the boat, you're guaranteed a seat. 
Uh, we have plenty of seats for you. If you, if you choose to sit, we have an interior air-conditioned uh, cabin, as well as we have an upper deck exterior uh, outdoor cab, uh, area to sit. Uh, bicycles are a lot on board, just like the bus. We can accommodate probably around 15 bicycles on any one trip. And uh, people do do that. They come by the bicycle, they board the boat. When they get to town, they ride. They ride right off to their workplace, whether it be the East Straub or Queens Hospital or um, or uh, what have you, wherever they're going. A university, HPU. Uh, we've been doing a lot of public outreach. Um, this is part of it, the neighborhood board meetings, as well as attending uh, community fairs and also uh, attending student orientations in, uh, like Remington College, Hill College, uh, HPU, uh, University of Hawaii, just to let those students know that this service is available to them. And, and because the boat offers the free Wi-Fi and work tables for them to work at, it's a great way to commute into town. They can they can get together in small groups from the, um, if they all live in the same area, and they can, they can work on a project or they can work on the computer while commuting. Um, the boat started uh, in September of uh, 17th of, of last year. We're, uh, we're funded by $5 million of federal funding for this project. We will uh, continue the operation through uh, June of 2009. City Council has budgeted uh, funding to continue the service. Um, we look at we continue to look at options to possibly expand the service. Uh, obviously, for us, Eva Beach is a is a an excellent location to have a landing. If we could provide a landing uh, from Eva Beach to the town, we could probably do a 30 minute, 30 minute, 35 minute transit. Um, so we continually try to um, negotiate with the Navy. Currently, the Navy's position uh, into allowing us into Pearl Harbor is um, due to security reasons. Um, they do not want to allow the boat uh, into the channel as uh, the state had, had done in the 99-2000 ferry demonstration. We even looked into the possibility of uh, entering Iroquois uh, Point Lagoon. And uh, when we looked at the, the soundings, the water uh, depth and the width of the channel, it's, it's not um, sufficient for the size of vessels that we're currently operating. So we will, you know, continually look at, at uh, other opportunities to provide a, an Elbow Beach link. But at the very least, um, this is our first step to trying to uh, uh, retuning the Route 41 is our first step to trying to provide um, a linkage for those uh, those residents. Uh, on our, we have a website it's called trytheboat.com. It's on the literature that you have in front of you. Uh, all this information that you're being handed out now is available on our website. And we also offer people to uh, subscribe to our instant email alerts if there's a change in service. We'll be, we'll be updated as soon as we know that there's going to be a change so that they know what, what to expect if they arrive at the pier. Uh, we also have a, an area for them to ask questions or provide comments. And that's, a, that's how we look at uh, making uh, service adjustments or improvements to try to make the service better. Uh, I'm currently the only one that reads those emails and responds to them so that the message that you get is consistent. Other than that, um, I'll, I'm free to answer questions. Okay, got a couple right here. Hang on a second. Oh, time out. We're going to freeze for you. commissioned by the military to be used in Kwajalein. Um, they were bought in the mid-90s by a company in Alaska, and we're currently leasing uh, them from Alaska. So there's no waiver. Okay, and would there be a position to... There was, there was a waiver in the 99-2000 ferry operation. Correct. And so the $5 million, when we split $10 million with Alaska, the $5 million at the time, it was to come to have a beach, because at that price tag, 
It was doable. What happened was, I believe the bid first came in, and they said, we're going to skirt and not come to Ever Beach because we're going to use the permanent uh, harbor over at Barber's Point. And that was because it's a monopoly. It really is. It, it would really be appreciated if you could go in and we could get our congressional delegation with your support that if we're going to make this the boat permanent, is that we can get boats from BC, British Columbia, we get boats from New Zealand, we get boats from Australia that are out there that can bring us the service we need. And then the price goes way down. But because of that Jones Act, we're locked into those, those boats, and those boats kept the price up. So I just want to let you know that $5 million is supposed to give us service as well. There would be a couple stops on board, but now you're skirting us and you're not coming by. So please support a waiver, or rather an exemption to the Jones Act of the state of Hawaii. That would be huge for us. Then we could turn the ocean into a super highway. Uh, sir, this one says that uh, senior annual pass is thirty dollars, and a senior card is ten dollars. The two question one: What's the difference between that and can I use this on the bus, or do I have to buy an, an, another annual pass for the bus? No, the, um, the, again, the, the system is treated as one transit system, whether you ride the bus or the boat. So your senior annual pass, if you have one will work uh, on this service. I believe the um, ID card uh, just identifies you as a senior and then, and then allows you to ride at half the fare, which would be a dollar. So that's the difference. If you pay, it makes sense for you to just pay the $30 because then you have unlimited travel for the entire year. But if you- For the bus and the boat. And the boat, yes, correct. Okay, what's the difference on the senior? If you get the senior card, it's just an ID to, to identify you as a senior citizen, and then that that allows you to pay half the fare. So a typical adult would pay two dollars. Oh, and you would just pay one. So if you're gonna ride the bus more than thirty times, it makes sense for you to just get the senior ID. I see. Thank you. Excuse me. Are you? I'm sorry. The senior bus pass. Yeah, it makes more sense to pay the $30 to get a senior bus pass. Are you going to have a park and ride here in Ever Beach for this? We don't have any current plans for a park and ride, but we may we may be able to look for one. That would be consideration to as part of as our service uh, improvement. We could certainly look at that. We we do have two park and rides now. Just uh, just so I can clarify that. And they're both, they're both free. We have carpool parking that's free, available at the pier, uh, two or more passengers. And we also have carpool, uh, we, we also have regular parking for, for anyone else at Kapolei Home Depot. We've uh, worked out an agreement with Kapolei Home Depot. They're allowing us to use some stalls. Uh, we have signs posted, reserved parking for the boat. And they're along the Kapolei Parkway frontage of the, of the parking lot. You would merely park there, step onto the sidewalk, and our Earth 13 shuttle will pick you up and take you to the pier. How many parking will be available? We, we have, you know, because we have this extensive shuttle bus service, although we might, we might have a total of 50 stalls between the two sites, there are only maybe less than 20 people using them. Most people would decide just to save their gas, leave their cars at home. You probably guys are looking into this, but just for your sake, are you guys working with Hoseko and trying to get them to accommodate the community of Little Beach? That, I'm so blessed to be here. Yeah, that is definitely a, a consideration that that we are we are considering and exploring. Um, Hoseko Harbor is still, you know, a bit a bit away, so it's not something that I can say is. Uh, going to be a reality just yet. How about if you don't ask you again? Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, go back this side. Um, can you tell me how stable is the working order of the boats? Because it seems like every time I watch the, the news, it's always broke down, it's not in order. So um, as passengers, you would want a stable commute. We're, we're currently running roughly at, at about a um, anywhere from 96 to 98% reliability, which means on average we, we run about 126 sailings, I think, a month. And that means missing any, anywhere from two to five sailings a month. 
So percentage-wise, I mean, it really isn't that, you know, uh, that many sailings. But we do, again, that's why we, we built that backup bus system just in case. So I mean, we do do maintain these vessels um, to a, a very high degree because we know that we don't have a, a third vessel. We are currently looking into the possibility of a, a, a third vessel, and uh, that will be, a, a, again, a part of our service improvement. Okay, let's go. Thank you for this presentation. Um, is, is the boat costing the city any money? Well, we, we do spend money on the shuttle bus service, so we provide, you know, that that is a, a separate bus line that services it. Are there metrics yet on the leeward ridership? How many people are, are riding from the Actually, coast? from the leeward coast, um, roughly, uh, roughly about 50% of our riders uh, make up the, uh, uh, that ride the boat come from the leeward coast. Is it believed that the wireless internet is uh, an attractive feature of the boat because one can telecommute while en route? Um, I know that some people do use that, and I, I, I regularly see roughly maybe about three to five people um, using notebooks. Uh, other people may have um, other types of uh, Wi-Fi devices like a, an iTouch or some other type of device, which I am not able to observe since they're in the lab. I suppose I'm asking this question because I'm trying to understand where resources do and don't exist. I, um, I personally pay for um, Wi-Fi in the city and county park in Waianae to encourage telecommuting. I, I pay right out of my checking account because the city and county does not have the uh, funds to pay for uh, internet connectivity and free Wi-Fi in the city and county park as is part of the project I have ongoing. So I keep checking my email hoping that some people I'm reaching out to to pay for the free Wi-Fi might actually accommodate me. It's both not a Cooley Beach Park, by the of the Waianae and, and other parks I'm trying to reach out to. So it's encouraging to hear that the city was active in working with DR Orton to promote their free Wi-Fi. And I would just hope that um, those of you who are interested and are attractive to the alternatives to driving, there are some of us here who are trying really hard, and I'm glad the city has money for this. I wish it could shake loose a little money to pay for the internet connectivity in the city and county parks because it's coming out of my pocket and uh, I can take more riders off the road than the boat can if the city actually got behind this and I suppose that's really not a question. I'm sorry for the editorializing, but it's really not right, but I'm glad you're here. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Uh, board members? No? Anybody from the community have any questions for uh, Darren? Cece? Let's ride the boat. Darren, <laughs> uh, thank you for mentioning the plans for expansion. Uh, as you know, um, through UNCLE, Interagency Coordination Council has been very supportive of the very good decades and the very just one component of multimodal improvements. <clears throat> when we registered and voted our strong, strong support because the federal funding was already in place, what we envisioned that you didn't mention was that um, after the Wiki Wiki Ferry was the state project, they called it a project rather than making it in their own mind something permanent rather than a test as they lay, well, the city's labeling this project. So the reason we were so supportive is we wanted a really expanded intra-island system, a very, very expanded system. And the first step that we thought we'd see through on home is when the city took it over, we thought we'd see signs on all the buses, you know, saying ride the ferry, and that it would be a ferry like other ferries are on the mainland. Here we are, uh, an island state. And yet, as uh, was mentioned today, rather than having the, our ocean as our superhighway, or even the method of travel of the ancient wines, we have our token ferry that has no signs even for the, for the tourists, or it has no tourist trips to begin with. So when you're expanding it, please look at it the way that ferries are everywhere else, that, that it's a, a full-time ferry service, not the token early morning and, and, and ends early in the afternoon, a really expanded ferry service. 
Thank you for mentioning the expansion. Um, well, I, uh, if I could respond to that a little bit. bit. Um, if you look at if you look at our schedules, um, that the rack cards that we've handed out, actually that rack card is really actually made kind of sort of like a tourist size card. Um, we do offer an opportunity for people for tourists, and, and tourists do catch the service. Um, especially during whale watching season. If you look on the card, there is a round trip icon and it tells you that uh, there are two opportunities for you to ride this service, round trip from along the tower. And uh, oh, we, we do have bus cards in every bus, island wide. It, they, they are on there, I've paid for them, I've seen them in the buses, and, that, and we've had them in the buses continuously before the start of the service. And we, so we do offer uh, opportunities for tourists to use this service. It is a, a, a public transportation service. And so they can, they can ride round trip from uh, 6.35 a.m. in the morning or at 3.55 p.m. in the afternoon, and they can ride the boat out and then ride it right back. And it, it, you know, it's a two-hour two -hour ride. Um, so there are there are opportunities that we do we do try to show that, that, that those kinds of opportunities are available for those types of people. Um, in terms of the service schedule, morning peak and afternoon peak, um, really it boils down to a financial prop, uh, question. The five million dollars can only take us so far. If uh, if I choose to run something in the middle of the day or in the afternoon, that means I have to take something else out. <coughs> So uh, I'm really trying to focus on uh, the, the morning commute and the afternoon commute with the available funding that I have. Certainly as we try to encourage the use of the system, and uh, again, you're correct, we're surrounded by water, we primarily, but we primarily use it for recreation. We don't use it for transportation like Seattle and San Francisco. And, and we have to, and this is part of growing that culture into using the system and, and making them comfortable with using it, such as having the backup shuttle bus, uh, uh, such as having that online uh, activity where they can get means and email. So all of that is kind of taken from from the uh, mainland. In fact, many uh, ferry systems um, they don't even offer backup shuttle bus, or if they offer a backup boat, it takes twice as long. And I don't think people would be willing to wait two two hour transits from. They rather just catch a bus. So you know we are we are trying to look at it, and as we grow the culture, certainly we can expand the service. Okay, good deal. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? No. Okay. Darren, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I'd like that, and I know there's some students over at Kelly Loan. Uh, I'm sure they'll be able to do that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, moving right along, our, uh, our time is ticking. Uh, can I get the mirror truck, Joyce? Available? Please. $80,000 and we've um, been able to increase that maximum amount to 150 did I say a million? I meant to say $80,000. From $80,000 to $150,000. And these funds are being made available through the Department of um, Housing and Urban Development and this is part of the Community Development Block Grant Program. These funds are interest-free loans um, to income qualified owner occupants. And um, as our surveys are indicating, more of our older adults are interested in aging in place, and these funds are available to these residents to make improvements to their homes, 
that include grab bars, widening doorways, non-skip floor, and other ADA type improvements. So we um, share that information with you. These, this program is administered through the Department of Community Services and the city's rehabilitation loan program. The next item I'd like to report on is there was a request for a bus route through the Lokahi Gardens at the Ever Villages um, project. Uh, the Department of Transportation Services reports that it will evaluate this um, request and report to the board in 60 days. They just caution that any um, consideration for new service would amount to, of course, additional funding and um, because of our limited resources, the new, new um, services may not be as readily available, but they would look at existing services and determine whether or not they are able to shift the resources and provide the service. The second item that I have to report to you on is a request to repave the roadway fronting Eva Elementary School. The Department of Facility Maintenance reports that the construction work along the PP is, I guess, being done by a private contractor as part of the Ocean Point development, and they continue to work with them to address your concerns regarding the roadway there. Um, another item I want to report to you on is your request for traffic engineering devices along the Kapolei Parkway. The Department of Transportation Services reports that the that they're working with the SACO to install additional traffic controls along this Kapolei Parkway, and they have agreed to install painted islands on both corners of Lipo Street and Papipi Road to shorten the pedestrian crossing distances in that area. And they've also agreed to upgrade the Halipo Street crosswalk to a more visible international type markings to improve the traffic operations at that intersection. With that, I am open for further questions or questions. Uh, Kurt? I would probably ask questions for like improving and construction areas to improve well, city or facilities. And of course, every time we have to go to the DOT, is there is there a way that, um, to, I understand that because of the liability and, and whatnot, but you know, I come to like the bus issue that I don't want to bring that up again, but come to the buses, especially with the bus drivers and all the people that employ and work for the city, knows that where is more uh, convenient for their customers. You know, customer relations. Mm -hmm. That's how you get people to ride and, and rent the boat or whatever. Um, can we figure out a way that the city can override uh, through the community's um, support of some of the things that, because we cannot, I, I cannot sit here and just stop at the whole national skill. To me, that's a, you know, you just come up behind me and fall scrap me, you know what I mean? It's, it's a, it's a cop-out. To me, that's a cop-out that they're going to say national standards. Knowing that, it's more accommodating for the customer to have safe or more safe. I mean, that's, you know, that's to me, don't have no uh, common ground when you're telling me, oh, but they're safe, but oh, but they're more safe. You, you know what I'm saying? I just say that because, because it seems like every time we ask you guys something, the city, you guys hands are tied because the DOT say, oh, because of a national skill. You know, why can't we say, oh, we have a study in the city of Elba Beach and oh, whatever is more safe than this area. You know, city by city or place by place. Don't give us a national standard because if we look at the national standards, those guys can't even carry the weight of our transportation. In, in the state of Hawaii on a national level. We have the best ridership, we have the best uh, buses, we have the best of everything. But it can't compare on a national level out there. I just wanted to know if there's something that we can do, or we can work with the state, or the DOT, or whatever it is we need to do to get this kind of stuff taken away. Because it's, it's sad that the community that they're servicing, all services, state and city, is gonna suffer. Not them, because they don't live here. In a short, short summary? Oh, awesome. 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 Hi, Gary. Good evening. Look, um, uh, the trees on Red King Road, I know that they go around the island to cut the trees. When will they come back to Red King Road? 
Okay, well I know um, this has been an ongoing concern of yours. This area along Renton Road is part of a contract and they do come their um, period of time that they go around the island and come back to Renton Road. It's on a cycle. I can certainly find out the next time they will be in this area. Um, but again, it is part of an annual contract that these, this tree, these trees you're concerned about are uh, addressed. Okay, thank you. I just want to know when's the next time that they will come. Okay, uh, Scott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, there's, two, there's two questions. This is a little follow-up, but I, I can get these in writing to you, but I'm still waiting on a response uh, from DTS about um, one question. Uh, was uh, given there are at least 24 closures within a stone's throw of my house in Eva, and given the tightened lending standards for home buyers, uh, what real effect can a uh, competitive construction market have uh, short of providing financing, reversing inflation, and stopping the growth of the middle class in India and China? In other words, should my house reach $300,000 again in its value, not $600,000? Uh, what are the real effects on the uh, transit forecast? And I'll follow up with, in writing to you on that. And hope the DTS can, can, can give us an answer. And also, uh, given that the uh, job infrastructure of the emerging EVA plane appears retail and housing dependent, has the city forecast the economic effects of a depressed consumer? on our budget forecast and on transit. And again, I don't expect answers. I just want to make sure that uh, these questions are being asked in something other than a private manner, because uh, they're important not only to me, but I think to, uh, to the community. So I'll, I'll follow up in writing. Thank you. OK, uh, just a reminder to the board members and uh, for the community as well, um, there are um, uh, forms over there that the, you can put uh, your questions in writing, and then uh, Joyce is very good about following up on those. As you can see, she comes prepared every meeting, and she reports on what she was asking at the uh, previous meeting. Uh, Ariel. Oh, sorry. Ariel. Uh, hello, Ariel. 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 Oh, sorry. New, new member over here. New member. Okay, Joyce, I brought it up this one uh, back in May 13th. 2008 on the email uh, regards about the two crosswalk yeah. along the Rustock Avenue by the gated community by the uh, railway down the Brunton Road <clears throat> and also along the Kabuli Parkway and Harpeter Road and that one I do believe I brought it up that couple of years ago Okay, Kapolei, I just reported that on that one, the Kapolei and the Pinto Road. Um, yeah, the Pinto the Road. They're looking to install um, stops. What are, I guess there are stop conditions on the Pinto Road to warn motorists of that, that upcoming um, intersection. PTS is looking to install that. There's no date on here, but it's, they're reporting that they're working with the SACO for that installation. Yeah, there's no crosswalk in there at all. Specifically crosswalks. Yeah. Um, along the Papito Road. Looks like they're. Kapole Parkway. Um, along the Papito Road, along Kapole Parkway. Okay. Um, okay, I'll look up, I'll, I'll report on that next month, but I also note that at Polito. The crosswalk is going to be installed. Okay. Okay, thank you, Kurt. The Wakapuna, I think you, you reported a few months back that it was the, you guys were working on the, the development of the project. I didn't finish the 
uh, I've been finishing the job, so I remember you saying something to that effect, so I guess um, if you can just look into that, that was the reason why I was waiting for funds. Did you talk about the resurfacing? Yeah, well, they did the microtolerance when they came over here, the company up in Atlanta. Yeah, Pua Kapuna. Yeah, Pua Kapuna. Mm -hmm. Right? Right? Yeah. And then up in Leaf, and I brought that up one time at the scene with the resurfacing on the background road. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so that's the last one, and yeah, we'll move on a little bit. We're almost on time, George. Okay, Joyce, quick one. Uh, fronting Evo Beach Elementary, I have noticed that the sidewalk is level with the road side. Are they going to build up the sidewalk? And... Um, I don't know. I, I will report to you. I'm just trying to recall if an earlier report I included it and that the current condition is, um, it is level with the roadway. And why? Why it doesn't, it's not, you wanted, you were requesting a raised sidewalk area for that area? Yeah, because there's no sense of putting the sidewalk when the cars can go on to the sidewalk without, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just level with the road. Okay, I understand. Thank you, guys. No, um, Temporary sidewalk that she's talking about. Uh, that's the reason why I went and asked that before. <coughs> if you could ask the developer, um, does the sidewalk, by not putting it in or putting it in, is it going to cause anything to the stopping of the workage because of the legalities that they're going through? Can they just finish the sidewalk so that, um, you know, it has nothing to do with the training, right? Thank you for reminding me. That's what the concern, right. concern yeah. is. It's the ongoing litigation. And um, they were not able to address that in that concern about uh, more standard sidewalks. I don't know the status of that litigation, but hopefully I'll have an answer for you. Okay, <laughs> you can take you away and uh, come to you and then you can go to follow up. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Councilman Paul. Thank you for your patience this evening. Good evening, board, the community. Um, so glad to be back. I missed the last two weeks. I was actually on vacation in June and then on a city trip to the National Conference Conference. Uh, then to go look at another waste to energy facility potential for our island uh, in July. So uh, glad to be back here. A couple of things. I want to thank the board. Uh, and Kurt was one of the individuals that came down to testify in the resolution for traffic engineering and traffic calming resolution. Uh, that we passed on the committee earlier and we will pass on the council hopefully uh, next week, uh, Wednesday on the 20th. And so again, that addresses that. Ask the department to make sure that they're relooking at these traffic engineering possibilities. But perhaps more important is to provide all of us with some guidance about how they deal with these so that neighborhood boards and communities can come to, whether it's your council member or to the department, to the city, and present the types of solutions you guys are looking for in a way that will work with what the department's doing so we can put all that together. Um, obviously, rail transit, big in the news. Uh, give us some again tonight for anyone that hasn't heard. Circuit Court judge has ruled that the city clerk needs to accept the petition of stop rail now. Um, what that means is the clerk needs to take it and go through the process of certifying these signatures. If there are sufficient signatures, then the petition question will be on the ballot in November. Uh, obviously, the question that's popped up has been, well, given that, should the council stop what it's doing and try to put the question on as a charter amendment? And my position has been, no, we should not. We need to move forward with that process. And the two biggest reasons are, number one, we don't know whether they have enough signatures or whether some other legal issue may prevent the petition question from being on the ballot. And I would hate to get us into a situation where the, the city council stops the petition doesn't work and we end up with no question on the ballot. I think everyone's in agreement that we want this question on the ballot so that the voters can settle it from that side as well. So the, the council, I think, really needs to continue to move forward with this. Um, the second one is in the conversations that we've gone through, I think the charter question that the council is proposing is a better question to be on a ballot than the petition question. And one of the main reasons is the stop rail now petition is a negative question. Right, which means if you want to say yes, you have to vote no, and if you want to say no, you have to vote yes. And that's just that's not the kind of situation that you want to present to the voters. The council question is a, is a 
I believe, a straightforward, positive question. Should the city and county move forward with this mass transit project? And so yes means yes, no, no means no. So I said, what I've said to a few people, it's been disappointing that the stop rail now hasn't come to work with the council on some of that language, so we can get one clean question. Uh, but we're going to deal with it uh, again next week, Wednesday at the 20th meeting as well, and, and hopefully from a council standpoint to move it out so we can ensure that that question is in fact on the ballot. Um, UH West Oahu Rezone, I know that's of interest to this board and this community. Um, we are, we will, should be taking that up again in the beginning of September in community meetings. Uh, hopefully get that, that zoning through so that West Oahu campus can become a reality. Obviously all the talk about transportation solutions. One of those, part of that solution is making sure that educational opportunities are here in West Oahu so that we don't all have to be traveling. Our kids, our students don't have to be traveling all the way to Manoa. Uh, for those projects or, or for that education. Um, finally, we had an update on, on the EVA DP, which uh, for those that have been involved in a lot of you longer than I have, has been a, a long-standing document that was supposed to be uh, re-updated over five years ago. It's supposed to be updated every five years, and for the past five years, past the point when it was supposed to be updated. The last uh, report that we got from DPP is they're hoping to have a draft out uh, to council for review and approval at the beginning of next year. Uh, but just as a warning, those dates have been out there before, and those dates have come and gone before. As I remember reviewing the, a draft of the DP before I was even on council. And now I've been on council for almost four years, and uh, we're still not done with it. So hopefully the department can get that out sooner than later. Um, so our last two quick notes. One is on the, on the candidate forms, which you guys mentioned earlier. Just so that you're all aware, because for the council, because there's only two people in the race for this district, there is no, the council race will not appear on the primary ballot. It will go straight to the general. That was a new charter amendment that was voted in two years ago. So I, I leave it up to you guys as to whether or not to include it in the first round or not, but that's, that's the situation. Uh, last, I have the honor of bringing with me tonight uh, the Certificate of Appreciation, this, uh, I'll read it real quick. The Certificate is awarded to the Evan Neighborhood Board Number 23 in recognition of valuable contributions to the 2008 fiscal year to the Oahu Metropolitan Planning Organization Citizen Advisory Committee. So some of these were passed out the last half of the meeting, uh, but I was able to bring this here to the board and I'll present it over and take any questions. Okay, thank you, uh, board members. Uh, Tom? Uh, very briefly, the Kaikano administration had advanced EIS for the Nimitz Flyover project that, that uh, I believe when the governor Lingle in 2003 said it would cost approximately $200,000. Excuse me, $200 million. We're looking at just under a billion dollars. There's no funding mechanism to address our lane deficiency. DOT Director Brennan Morocco was here last month. And he said that Nimitz flyover concept will not be advanced without tolling authority. The north-south road, we're building only three of the six lanes, the fourth lane being a shoulder lane. It's supposed to connect and go all the way down the north-south road to Keoneula Boulevard. Okay? There's no money to do that. There's no money for the afternoon trip lane. The funding mechanisms of $140 million we get from the federal government is not going to cut it anymore. And I'm looking at your report that appears you're opposed to toll roads because if you don't have tolling authority, you're going to get no roads. And we are lane deficient. So I'd like you to, if you can, give us your position. Are you willing to entertain toll roads? And if you are not, what's your solution to get us out of this lane deficiency status? How do you plan on funding lane capacity to meet the level of growth of the, of the 12,000 more homes coming on the other plane, we're all getting on the H1. That's a level of service F. And with rail in full operation, we'll still be at a level of service F. So how are you going to fund that added lane capacity with your opposition to toll roads? Thank you. Okay. And like you said, uh, the state needs to come up with that money. They have tax and authority in the state legislature and the governor needs to take the step to come up with that money. That is how you fund those things. Um, the reason I have opposed the toll roads, I may have talked about it here before, and I know I've talked to uh, DOT Director Brenda Morioka about this. Toll roads are really just a tax, right? You're getting the people to pay for those roads. And when you do a toll road, the only 
people that are paying for them are those that are using it. And it is unfair for West Oahu to have to pay for their roads when nobody else on this island has to pay for theirs. What I've told the director is, if you can show me that there is equal lane miles per capita in West Oahu as there is for East Oahu and Windward Oahu, then you can start holding our roads as long as you do it to everybody else. But if, if the city and state governments are going to direct growth out here, then the entire city and state governments need to fund the money for those toll roads. And it needs to be shared by the entire island and by the entire state. It should not be borne only by West Oahu residents who are forced to use that because, as you say, they have no other choice. They, they can't get on H1 because it's at, at an F level, we, even, if, even with rail. So again, I am not going to support, and I don't think it's right whether it was my community or some other community, that they ought to be paying a toll to pay for those roads when it's something that the entire state in this situation should be paying for. So I mean, that, that's, that's my back, backing for my position of the way to fund it is the state needs to come up with that money. Similar mechanism happened for this rail, adding on a half percent excise tax. If we are that short of money, if that's what we need, we need to we need to have the courage. The elected officials need to have the courage to add that tax to bring in that infrastructure. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Celeste? As far as the rail, I'm sorry. Uh, I have a question. At one point, when they said that the rail will service uh, West Oahu, uh, UH, and then later they changed it to relocate it to Ho'opili. Then people got, was up for it, and what, what was the reason of the relocation? Um, I didn't hear anything after that. Okay, I love Now, so Try. my question is, is this for Ho'opili, or is this for Wasawahu, UH Wasawahu? Yeah, and as I've said to a few groups, I feel like I could run a, a year-long college course on, on this whole project, and I'm trying to Bring this down because I'll be telling you from what I understand, it was not for Whole Peely. Um, Whole Peely was almost victimized by by some of these changes because they had to give up a whole bunch more land if that station was put directly into their development. Uh, what had happened was the city had tried at one point to take the rail line into the campus area, which I think is if you guys have seen the project, the actual campus isn't along the north south road, right? There's some there's a mixed use area between there. By going into the campus, it then would have to turn down and cut through DHHL's housing development. That just didn't work for, for all the developments that were going on there. So the city said, well, we're not going to do that, but we're going to back it all the way up and take it through um, into Horton's land, which is what you heard. Became a big mess, you're right. Uh, but I think the upside is everyone got together, uh, the mayor got everyone together in one, one room, and we came up with the, which I think is the right solution to take that, again, it comes through Ho'opili and then straight down North South Road, so that station is right on North South Road, as close to the UH campus as it can get without interfering with the housing developments of the Hawaii homelands and some of the others. So I think everyone believed we got to the right answer. I don't know that that was reported in the end. But uh, even the UH West Long Chance is very happy with its current location. Okay. Any other board members? Okay. So, quarter of a mile. Less than a quarter of a mile. Yes, just no, okay. Anybody from the community? Oh, oh, Gary, sorry. Um, well, Paul, um, regarding what he said and what um, the elevated, um, versatile expressway. Well, the elevated roads that, uh, and, and then the, the use was that they're going to put the rail on it. And um, my original concept when they when they voted for the elevated uh, roads was that anybody who's going to use it going to pay a toll if they have to use it. But your concept is that if they're going to use it, the whole I mean, if they're going to build it, the whole island, everybody has to pay for it. Uh, I kind of disagree with what you say. If you're going to use it, you pay for it. That's what I say. Then if the East people are not going to use it, why do they have to pay for it? <laughs> I think that we're going to pay for it. Anybody who wants to use it, they, they pay it. 
it's, it's, I'll tell you, it, and as I it's said, it's a choice that you guys gave me. It's a system that you can go to, but in order to be fair in doing that, then you have to do the same thing with Kalaniana Oli Highway for East Oahu. You have to do the same thing with Poli and Liki Liki. Why are we paying state tax dollars? for that maintenance when we're not using it. But again, it's difficult to get down to that kind of allocation, which is why the government set up the way it is. Well, I, I, I agree with what you said on the Kalalia Nalo there. And uh, the roads that we're gonna use in a portion of um, the elevated roads. Now, anybody who's gonna use that gonna to have to pay an extra to use that, that's what I mean. That's because the private sector owns it. Yeah, and that, and as, again, as I told the, told the director, is if, if we're totally, if everyone has to pay for their own section, then I'm fine with that, then it's equitable. But it's not fair to have that type of system only for West Oahu. And that, that's my point. Well, okay, I, I, I kind of agree with you on a win-win situation on that. I still want, if, if in the building, whoever uses it, still have to pay an additional cost on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kurt, what? No? Good, thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Don. Appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Johnson, how are you tonight? Tired. Tired, I hear you. It's okay, the commute home is easier though. Well, yeah, but it's longer, it's farther away. Uh, good evening, I just have four quick things. Uh, the governor announced last week the Department of Human Services, excuse me, the Department of Human Resources Development was going to uh, initiate a pilot project of working four days a week, Monday through Thursday, uh, from 4 October to 31 October, um, from 7.15 in the morning till 6 p.m. They're doing that to see if we're going to save money on Friday where there's no one there. We're going to run air conditioning the whole day. There'll be less traffic for Friday. Um, also, the Department of Health and Department of Education will be uh, kicking off its 2008-2009 flu season called Stop Flu in School Vaccination Program for children aged 5 through 13. The vaccinations will be free. Participating schools will be distributing parent and guardian information packets this week. And sent forms in the package will be turned in by September 5th. And DOE will provide, excuse me, DOE will provide participating schools with banners to put up in the schools. All the information I'm providing is in the handouts over here on the table. Um, also, as part of the Hawaii Innovation Initiative, Governor Lingo is presenting monthly innovation awards to acknowledge and encourage innovation across the state and sections of Hawaii. Residents are encouraged to nominate deserving organizations and individuals. Uh, more information is in the flyers. In addition, the last thing I have is um, Governor Lingo will host the fifth annual International Women's Leadership Conference on Wednesday, September 24th at the Sheridan White Key Hotel. More information is in the packet and on the state's website. All right, thank you very much, board members. Any questions for uh, Mr. Johnson? Monique? Hi, I apologize for um, missing Tisha last month, but can you just, um, I'm not sure if this is a question for you, are there going to be any bike paths through Kalaiwa? Through uh, bike paths? Yeah. To the new housing development? Um, just the whole Barber's Point from here to go to Kapolei. The, I'll, uh, I'll ask the uh, Department of Transportation. Okay. I'll ask Brennan. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Celeste? So Hi. Um, I just want some follow up along the golf course area at North Road. I understand, um, I think it was back in June, it was brought up as an issue of um, children walking along there and they can't walk on the side because of the overgrown bush. The overgrown bush was already taken up. It was already taken up. That was my understanding. And I oh, believe no. Brandon reported that last month. No? No. It's still there. As a matter of fact, back in um, July, they stated that, um, I guess, Representative Klein and um, Liz Farrell stated that they have a crew, I guess an inside crew, that's going to be turned up the place, but 
I just passed her before on the way here, and it's still a total mess. Yeah. Is it a today yeah. yeah. Not a pro. Not a pro. Not a pro. It's the golf course. Yeah, it's the golf course. And it's, golf course. And, uh, it's also partially private. Can they, can they treat it like how the military is treating up their area, you know, because going into Air Force Point, their section is really nice and clean. And people can walk on those areas. So, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, they just told me it was a city. All the time I thought it was a state. Well, I think the state owned part of the, the, not that road, but the Fort Lee Road. I think you're talking about the road leading into, uh, going back point, point. into the development. Yeah, yeah the state development. That, is the, that fence is owned by the golf course, that's correct. All right. It's, uh, uh, just for clarification, part of that road involves the city. It gets to a point where it becomes private, where the golf course owns it. And then on the other side of that, the federal has a road. So it's a three partner. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is, uh, again, a little bit more clarification for Celeste and some of the other members. Uh, there has been some talk about uh, doing some uh, work out there. The golf course has uh, actually uh, volunteered to take, uh, take the lead on that. And they're also looking for some uh, uh, assistance with volunteers that will clean up that area. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> All right. so that money which is being spent on the war machine and spend it domestically and see if we can get more money from our federal government, not only for our, our roads, but our schools as well, and the other means that which you have. But economically, our, our nation is going through uh, a downturn, of which we're probably all aware. Um, monthly, we get new reports about people being laid off, Business is closing. So in terms of raising taxes, that's probably not anything you're going to see the governor, the mayor, the legislature, any council um, recommending. But as far as dealing with our transportation problem, um, we're, we're looking at the whole gamut, as you know. And um, Councilman uh, uh, Cole, or, or was it uh, Tommy Johnson mentioned the four-day work week. I've been um, talking with um, the Speaker of the House and the Senate, Senate President as well regarding Maybe having the state capital do a pilot program as well. Um, we're trying to get more jobs out here. And this is going to be one of the issues this election year, of course, and in future election years, on how we deal with all of these issues and the rising costs, especially since in the last year, the price of gas has skyrocketed. And right now, there's really no end in this increase, or at least any um, way to predict that the barrel of oil will go to less than $100 and the price will one day go under $3. This is now the predict predicament that government and the public sector is dealing with and, and it's going to take the whole community to come up with a solution. So you'll introduce a total bill again next year? Mm -hmm. I don't have any problem, but the problem is getting our, our Senate transportation share to hear that bill. You're right. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm going to give it to Gary here, but I got uh, just a quick follow up. You know, in that aerospace, uh, can you repeat the time and the date on that again? August 21st, Thursday. The registration is at 8.30, it begins at 9, and it should end around 5 o'clock. 5 o'clock, though, there will be a movie if anyone wants to watch the movie. Okay. But on space. Okay. Oh, that was almost my same question, but there was something about the August 21st then August 25th. Uh, there was a transportation meeting, uh, but the 26th you have a flyer. But yes, you said something about the 21st and the 25th. Right, the 25th oh. is the EVA Transportation Coalition, which will be at Kapolei Halle. Okay, no, I got it. Thank you. And that's where developers, city states, We'll provide updates on transportation projects. Okay, good enough. Uh, board members? Anybody? Okay, so us. Hi, Lily. I just wanted to follow up. Um, did you hear anything about the relocation of the bus stops? 
I was meeting with Brett and Morioka Monday at 8.30, and I received a message at about 4 o'clock that he canceled that meeting. So he wanted to, as you know, close, consider closing the entrance to Fort Weaver, from Fort Weaver Road into the shopping center and take the bus stop and move it north. As far as I Right, because uh, some Terra residents and many did not want us to move the bus stop south. So one option he came up with was to move it north, but to close that. And in the poll that I took, which I shared with him, of 160 or 70 people who responded, 90% of them said, no, do not do that. So at this stage, we haven't heard any definitive plan from the Department of Transportation. There is none. Okay. We did have a question because he did bring up about having a bus stop located in front of our shopping center or in front of a you know, uh, area like that. My question is, what is he going to do to the bus stop in front of cities? Being that he wants it far sighted. He wants the bus stop to be located after the intersection. In front of Zippy? The Zippy's coming in on top of and the, uh, uh, the, uh, oh, across from 7-Eleven. Yeah. By 7-Eleven. Right I in front of it. I think he's planning on making that there. In front of Zippy's there is a bus stop. It's not in front of Zippy's. Yes, there is. Is there one? There is. Yeah. It's directly in front of Zippy's. And it means that he wants it far side of it. Yeah. Far so if, he, if he's pushing for what he said. He's going to close that bus stop? Yeah, just, just well, to clarify for us. You know, that has not come up. Yeah. I don't know if it's on his radar or not, but we can ask him and, and get an answer on that. <coughs> the Zippy's bus stop. Okay. Yeah, because he did make uh, mention that uh, he was looking at all bus stops on Fort Weaver Road. Right. And at that time, when we saw him, and uh, I think he only mentioned three, and he said that was it. But he also stated that all the bus stops were going to be moved to the far side of the traffic light. But there's already one on that far side by the railroad. Yeah. That's a good question. Okay. Since we're talking about the one in front of Zippy, are they going to, uh, when they do the Fort Weaver Road widening, are they going to put the sidewalks for our handicap and uh, people that have a hard time walking? Yes. Um, I thought that was supposed to be the responsibility at that time for Zippy's to put that improvement because they're uh, in front of Zippy's and in their parking lot area, is not adequate for probably people that have a hard time walking or wheelchair, especially by West Oahu Credit Union. If you look at that, uh, ramp. If you go down and you lose your balance with your wheelchair or your, your, you don't hold it well, you went straight into the graveyard. That's how steep it is. The sidewalks on the Fort River Road widening project are yeah. all part of the current plan and funding, and it will be paid for by by the state, and we will put those in. And by the way, the speed limit will go from 45 to 35 on Fort River Road once it is complete. Because it, uh, I think because it's an urban, it'll be an urban designation now. Uh, it'll be similar to to the Pali Kalika Um yeah. People zip up and down there, but the speed limit is 35 miles per hour. Okay. Uh, I know they're doing the construction, right? And, and it's all good and said and done. But why let our plants die? You know, in the middle strip. Yeah. I mean, I understand they have to cut your bottom lines. Um, if the developer is doing that. I know they have water trucks with real good water, that's what we found out. <laughs> if you ask them if they can water our plants, since our plants are dying in that area. Well, I'll bring that up at the Ever Transportation Commission meeting. Okay, uh, Ariel. Okay, Senator, I just got a question regards about those restricting me at Fort River Road. What happened is right now you have groups right on the middle of the road where it used to be the old street. Right. Are they going to re repave the whole Fort River after all this, or are we going to wait another 10 years before they're going to repave the road? Well, I do not think repaving is part of the widening. Uh, I could check on that as well, but I do not think that it's part of the widening. I think they should include that. I'll let them know. All right, we got to move on. we got to move on. We really got to move on. Oh, yeah. Is it is it that important? No, okay, I, thank I, you. I, since you brought it up, I do have Okay, well, I want you to take it offline. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Senator. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, is uh, Representative Cavanello here?